Hey guys, hope you guys are doing well today. Thank you so much for tuning in into the Inspo Depot podcast by Insporium Network. For those of you who don't know, my name is Reis and I am the founder of Insporium Network. So Insporium Network is an entertainment media network for professionals. And Inspo Depot podcast is one of the pillar content that we have here on this channel. On this podcast, we have upcoming talents, upcoming creators, entrepreneurs, personalities, and athletes to share their perspectives, to share their thoughts, to share their insights about their respective industries and how we can understand it better and how it will be helpful for us in our future. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into the podcast and I'll see you on the other side. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first ever Inspo Depot podcast and joining me today is Mr. Jasmine Jaffa. Hello, hello guys. <laughs> hey Jasmine, um, why don't you introduce yourself to the people? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Jasmine Jaffa, I'm an international racing driver. Um, I've raced uh, internationally for almost 22 years. Um, I'm also on the board of uh, Sapang International Circuit and uh, vice chairman of the Road Safety Council of Johor State. So, pretty busy, but uh, yeah. So, all good. Thanks for your time have, having to squeeze this podcast in. No, thanks for, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, share us a little bit like your early days before you knew that this was the thing that you want to do, like your go-karting days. Wow, okay. So, it's back in uh, 1998. Um, I was six years old. You know, I've, I've always had a passion for cars. Um, I collected Hot Wheels, Tamiya cars, and etc. And uh, so, the passion of cars has always been there. Only until one day in, um, uh, in Shah Alam, a family friend invited us to, to watch a go-kart race. Never knew what a go-kart was. So I arrived on a Sunday morning and I saw kids around my age racing. So I was like, you know, these guys don't have license. You, know, they, <laughs> you, you only know the common, uh, uh, you know, common way to, to, to uh, get your license and you know and, and, and the things I heard was you know at 16 or 17 years old yep. at the time so kids my age were racing and I was so so amazed and um, I was so intrigued and I wanted to try so my late father was like uh, you know you want to have a go we can get something organized so the following week I, I, I tried a go-kart for the very first time I was very small very tiny so they needed to put wooden blocks for uh. me to fit in the go-kart and etc so um, from there, that's where I started go-karting. And um, I started at a national level, then I did um, the Asian level, then the European level, and, and so on and so on after I did international Eva. So at 14 was when I turned pro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by turn pro at 14? So um, you see, at a national level at that time, you, a lot of things, um, you need to find your, your, your own sponsors and and uh, we had a little bit of, of, of sponsorship ourselves to, to start the career. But turning pro um, meant that I was uh, under a development program, which oh. was Petronas. Okay. So Petronas had a, a, a pool of talents called P, under PTP, which is Petronas Talent Development Program. And uh, that's when it became full-time. It was like a full-time job, but under the purview of Petronas. So mm -hmm. I was there for about eight years. And, uh, and I moved uh, to the UK when I was 15. So it's been, it's been quite a journey since. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, during those early days that you... I, I know that you want to try go-kart. But when was it that you said like, fuck, this is what I want to do for the rest <laughs> of my life? You know... Um, I was, I was really, really young, and I remember I was eight years old, and at eight was when I first won my uh, cutting event. Oh, okay. it, was, it was in Shah Alam as well. And, um, and a lot of my peers at that time were, were a lot older than I was. You know, they were physically stronger, um, they had more experience, etc. So when I won my first race was when I told my parents I wanted to be in uh, Formula One. Mm. So that's when the dream uh, sort of, uh, or dream and target sort of formed by itself and I just wanted to chase the dream, you know. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how the career took off and, but everything was based on results, you know. I had, I had results, I had exposure, then sponsorship came and then, you know, Petronas furthered my career and etc. So, 
it's been quite a quite quite a big step uh, from from eight years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah. was. And at eight years old, you already said to your parents that you, fuck, mom, okay, you didn't say fuck, but like <laughs> at that time you said like, hey, mom, that I wanna be a Formula One. Yeah, right? yeah. It was hard to convince them. Like, mom was so worried about the safety aspects, Correct. and then my siblings were, you know, what about school and etc. And it's all about adapting, la. So, you know, I had a very supportive school, which was uh, Chempaka. Mm. And they were very co-curricular, uh, you know, driven. So, you know, even some some time when I was away from school, um, I had to stay back after school to catch up on my work. So I wasn't really left behind, you know. And and my badge, I had, um, you know, other athletes also that were traveling and etc. So we we kind of had kind of had a common ground on what we're doing. So, um, so school was still a priority for me. So mm. it's un- until I turned pro when I when I was in the UK, then you know training started picking up and the reality starts uh, kicking in la, to perform especially. Mm. Yeah. Talking about your dream to become an F1 driver in 2015, you won the Monaco race, yep. uh, Formula Renault 3.5, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And that was the time where you were kind of like spot to be like the next F1 driver under Petronas, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. But you were also scouted by several other teams. Yeah, so um, winning Monaco was, was special, you know. Correct. Because uh, to race in Monaco, it's it's already a privilege on its own, but uh, to win it is is a totally different, uh, you know, ball game on its yeah. own. Now the Monaco uh, Formula Renault three point five normally holds um, in the morning of the Formula One weekend. So mm. on the Sunday morning, you get big crowds and everyone's already there. But the Sunday morning of the race, I had problems with my, my race car. I couldn't shift into gears. I had ele- electronic problems. Everything was going haywire the morning of the race. Mm. So um, I was, you know, I had my heart rate through the roof. My, 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 I, I have sweaty palms, so I, I, I get nervous quite easily. So um, that, that all came about, but they managed to fix the car, you know, and a half an hour problem, they managed to fix it in like six, eight minutes, right? So um, I was a bit left behind. I qualified pole, had a good start, decent start, uh, and that's when I, I pulled away and, and, and won the race. Lah. So Monaco itself was, was awesome, and that, that put the, the flag on the world stage, you know, the Nagaraku played, and then teams started... Um, approaching you know like they, they wanted to sit down and see how we can further my career into formula one but the thing about formula one is that um it requires a lot of support you know beyond just cooperation you know you need you need a, a full amount of country support to get in get in there because it, it it does require some form of sponsorship but huge returns because of the exposure so I was I was uh, approached by Mercedes powered teams because of the Petronas link, mm. but uh, two offers came on the table uh, um, that gave me a contract. So I had a I had a a deadline to meet. So when when I was offered the the actual drive, um, a lot of uh, uh, things happened at the same time. So at that time, uh, politically it was it wasn't a healthy time. And also, Petronas had a the oil and gas industry had a, a plummet of uh, an oil crisis, so there were several cut of jobs and everything. So, to justify to go to Formula One didn't happen, la. so which is a shame. But um, I'm I veered off into another set of my career. La. But what was the underlying factor that other people, not just you, but like in general, like other drivers as well, that other people don't really know, um, <laughs> besides being a good driver. <laughs> You know, uh, to be a complete racing driver requires more than, you know, I, th- I think a lot of people see being a racing driver as the glitz and glamour of having the ability to travel, drive nice cars and, you know, race everywhere. But, but the tough element is always having to perform because it's, it's not just a cheap spot that you can just put your helmet and Correct. just drive, right? So... You know the 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 main underlying factor is that you represent um, big corporations. You know, like Petronas, and I had other sponsors uh, that growing up, I had, for example, Sapura, Ranhill, and etc. And mm. these guys, yes, although they sponsor, no matter big or small, um, they have hopes of you performing. So the pressure to perform is always there, whether it's fitness and and etc. 
um, beyond fitness, um, you represent yourself, you know, as a brand. So like Jasmine himself, you know. Mm. So when you meet teams, meet corporations, that's how you want to be represented to them. So a lot of that factors is also life beyond being at the racetrack lah, that you have to represent. So it takes it takes time to learn and develop because you're so young and, and trying to you know adapt to this uh, industry. But in the end, you learn on the way, lah, you know. And I I I enjoyed the journey very much. I know I enjoyed the pressure. But some days, it's uh, on a bad day, it can be very uh, mentally challenging. Mm. Mm. So after that, um, that change to further your career, your own mm. self, right? Um, you also went to the WEC, the World Injury Championship, right? Mm. So in 2018, you went on and win podiums and you won like first place mm. and third place? Yeah, correct, wrong, right? correct. And you were with... Um, our friends uh, Weron and Nabil right <laughs> and then you also made it into the Malaysian Motorsport Hall of Fame mm, right mm. and about 20 years into your career have you ever thought or dreamt of being in the Malaysian Motorsport Hall of Fame <laughs> good question you know when I was 8 years old as I mentioned earlier um, was also the first um, trophy I got by being uh, international go Carter of the year uh, oh yeah, at 8 at, years old at 8 years old at that time and but the person that won International Racing Driver of the Year and Hall of Fame was Karamjit Singh. He was mm. a f- he's a famous rally driver that brought us uh, into the world stage, and he carried the Malaysian flag everywhere he went. And um, and when I was eight, I looked up to him and I said, "Wow, you know, imagine being a Carter. You had you know you you were so you were so proud, but being an International Racing Driver of the Year and Hall of Fame was a totally you a know, next game. level, yeah. right?" So when I saw him, I was so amazed and, and I said, you know, one day I want to be there, right? So as the career moved on and winning WEC and fighting for a drive and, and you know, and working together as a team, as an all-Malaysian lineup, being in Le Mans and, and all of that, um, the, the, the results was recognized by, by the authorities and, and, um, and I was very proud, like, actually, because... You know, Karamjit was a lot older than I was, and and I'm 25 when I got the Hall of Fame, mm. so it's a it's a big part of my career as well. And it was presented by Tone at that time, so it was it was special. Mm. It was very special. What goes through your mind like when you put on your racing suit? <laughs> Zero distractions. <laughs> are you like nervous, or are you like excited, or like you pumped, or? I'm actually super pumped. You know, like half an hour before my a- any. Any session actually at a racetrack, mm. half an hour I'll have my headphones on and I listen to music and hip hop or, or th- anything, a lot of bass calms me down, which is right. really weird. But it pumps me up to, to prepare for my session. So, you know, um, when I race and when the helmet is on, it's fully, fully concentrated in, in performing. And during a race, sometimes during a race weekend, there's a lot of adaptation to, to pick up from because different tracks have different grips, Correct. different weather, but you have to multitask with the car. So you've got to learn the car in and out and you have to communicate with your engineer to the absolute detail. Because some details that is given uh, to your engineer that might be wrong can lead you to a wrong path. Mm. So from free practice one, from when you arrive to, let's say, a race in Japan, you got to know the track, you've got to know the gears, you have to know, you know, the tyres and what setup you want to you wanna head towards to, and that gives the comfort to the engineers. So when the race happens, everything becomes seamless, you know. So that's ah. how I approach my weekends. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. So how, how, how close are you with your, like, engineers? Like, when everything that you go through, like, you have to make new relationships with every new engineer. Yeah, correct. And that's not going to be easy. So yeah. how was your experience working with multiple different people? Yeah, I mean, um, I, learned, I learned a lot when I was based in the UK. Lah, you know, I had, a, I had a great teacher at the time called Jimmy. Jimmy's based in the UK, slightly outside London. And he taught me a lot of, you know, driver-engineer relationship. Um, and I know a lot of drivers make a lot of effort for that, mm. you know. Um, um, for example, Kimi Raikkonen brings his whole engineering team for dinner over to his house, and and because the engineers can understand your your lingo and what you like, what you don't like, because that's that's how you communicate with the car as well. And as for me, I I spend a lot of the time at the track and and having 
uh, dinners at at the venue because most of my engineers are, are everywhere and you know funny enough my engineer last year is German but she's a she's a lady and uh, her attention to detail was was extraordinary you know so you have to keep up to that as well and um, I'm also quite um, particular with how a car is set up so I'm involved with how you know the car evolves into such such development so i'm a bit obsessed sometimes too obsessed but it's it's my my passion you know correct. yeah that drives you forward correct. correct um i've seen some documentaries that our friends made our friends from tgtr um, <laughs> uh seen pride I've seen glory yeah. right those are like yeah you're in it right and it tells a very great story of your journey into all these races and whatnot. Mm. But what is your most memorable race that you've ever driven in your life? Um, well, there's a lot of race events, but winning Monaco was special because um, obviously the challenges that I faced, um, having Petronas and then Formula One weekend and, and, and you know, Nagaraku being paid out of all places, right? And um, yeah, I mean, I still wipe the trophy today, you know, and 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 relive that moment. Lah. But um, that that is also a big turning point in my career. Um, you know, not a lot of Asian drivers have made it that far, and um, I know several drivers that have tried. But I I I'm I'm honoured to have tried on my third attempt to actually win it. So uh, now the the you know to whoever who achieve. Uh, the same would would have the same turning point in their careers, lah. So it meant a lot to me. Mm. Mm. Good, good. I mean, it's a it's a it's an undeniably a great great achievement, mm. right? Um, also, you mentioned earlier when you were introducing yourself that you <laughs> hold you are one of the directors for Sepang International mm. Circuit, and mm. you were the vice chairman for the Johor State Road Council. Yes. Right? In general, do you think like it's time for? much older, much more experienced people to give opportunities to younger people to make decisions and give out their opinions? Uh, yes and no. I think yes, in a sense that uh, the youth is more exposed nowadays in terms of, uh, you know, uh, technology, IR 4.0, research and development and stuff like that. I think we can be in the know in, in you know, a couple of hours or a couple of days. But the older generation would have more hands-on experience so I think if you put the two together it would bring you a strong team mm. you know but uh, yes the, the youth should be given more chances in a bigger seat um, and and voice out and, and give the opportunity to show what they're really worth because I think a lot of the youth are still um, has not shown enough confidence that they can actually deliver mm. you know so I think uh, to a lot of the youth out there I think you have a strong voice to actually uh, be given an opportunity do you think they don't have that confidence because they are afraid to be beat down by much? yeah you, you know funny enough you mentioned beaten down I've been beaten down so many times I'm you sure. know? <laughs> so many times and, and being involved in such roles also brings a lot of pressure right Correct. and and a lot of people are saying like you know you only at, at the time when I got I got uh, I got appointed I was 26 you know you know what does this what does this kid know you know and etc etc and and here I am today you know we've we've set up programs we we're, we're making motorsports more affordable for the next generation you know I want go karting to be an opportunity for everyone not as difficult as when I started you know mm. and and all of this is based on on hands-on groundwork that the youth has been doing, you know. So for the next gen, the numbers will just grow and that's what I want to achieve for and giving back to the industry. Mm. Mm. How has, like, how has motorsports has changed in the past 10 years? And now, wow. especially after the pandemic, with the <laughs> F1, you can't, you can't have supporters yeah, and whatnot. Exactly. Yeah. What's your point of view in the change of motorsports across these 10 years? Um, coronavirus has really changed people's mindset. But um, it also opens up new opportunities, you know. Um, for example, uh, if you're entering to IR 4.0, uh, there, is, there is new technology like autonomous cars, driverless cars. There is also drone um, racing and, mm -hmm. and there's also um, different techs and innovation that is um, maturing within the automotive industry. Now, that is something Malaysia should grasp on because you're talking about the next gen, right? And uh, although China 
uh, or America has, has created it, but Sepang can be a hub for it, you know. But it, coming into the new norm, uh, like what we're doing today, right, media and online social media avenue is so accessible that whether you're there or not, it does not matter mm -hmm. because the viewerships is, are still very big. People want to be there to be in an atmosphere, but coming to a new normal, I think IR 4.0 will just take over if, if uh, we grasp on it. Mm. Like when when you mentioned like new tech and whatnot, like recently also during the during the lockdown, yeah, um, no, not during the lockdown because our uh, all the lockdowns in the world are <laughs> ver varies across countries, right? Yeah, yeah. But during um, the time where F one wasn't around because they had to hold it a bit, <laughs> all these all these races they have their own streams, yeah, right? like yeah. Albon, Leclerc, correct, Lando Norris, they all have their own streams and they're just having fun online. Correct, right? correct. Yeah, do you think, um, or is there any plan for Malaysian motorsport, e-sports? Um, Industry? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know e-sports is, um, funny enough, it's touching almost, a, it's a billion dollar industry actually mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, there are players um, in the game like Race Room, uh, e-racing Grand Prix, which is done by Alex Young. Mm -hmm. There is also um, Motorsport Association of Malaysia. They formed a, a much more formalized uh, championship over lockdown called the Lockdown Virtual Championship, etc. But um, the, bridging, the bridging to the automotive industry has not been matured yet because I think the numbers are still quite small. But I would see in the short term there will be big, bigger, bigger growth. Now, to further these talents is something that uh, the industry players needs to, to look up to. Um, and changing from virtual to reality only gives um, the talents their dreams, you know, because at the end of the day, you want to achieve being at the top, you know, drive, right. working for, for example, I don't know, uh, Honda Racing, you know, and you started from the simulator. And there mm. are talents from like Nissan, who, who used to play GT Academy Gran Turismo, like Jan Mardenborough. Mm. And um, now he's racing in Super GT500, which is my dream to race in GT500. And he's like having a professional career. He started from video games at 12 years old. So anything can be achievable from that, that front. Lah. So I think the industry is growing. It's going to take a bit of time to mature and, and have a, a singular pathway for everyone to, to target from. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Now, let's talk about F1 a bit. Okay. Right. Um, recently... Uh, F1 rules, I, I don't know about you, mm. but like for me as someone who's just a general, like just a normal, a normal fan of the sport. Yeah, yeah. Um, the rules are getting tighter and tighter, yeah. especially the recent one involving Mercedes Petro AMG Petronas where the dual axis steering system, yes. the DAS system is not going to be able to be used next year, right? Um, do you think all these tighter rules that's been come up by, by being created by FIA is gonna make the sport a little bit more boring. <laughs> um, Formula One has a big problem, which is the cost factor. Um, some teams are running 350 million budget a year. Some teams are running 180. Some of the back teams are even running 80 million. So R and D is an element that sky's the limit. The more you have money, the car gets better. More, more aero gizmos, more tech goes into it. Right now. Um, them approaching cost cap has been a long argument and battle, and I'm, I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy and not happy that COVID came, that you have to postpone the race. But I'm happy that the cost cap actually came for them, mm -hmm. so that everyone, everyone now has an equal, slightly Playing more field. equal chance. Mm -hmm. Now, how long it will last for, I don't know. But the other problem about Formula One is that once you, you, you tighten the rules, tighten the rules, tighten the rules. The smart engineers will find a loophole, always find a loophole to develop, you know, like the brake duct system, the <laughs> dust system. And these are loopholes in the, in the regulations. So you, you're kind of like fighting against the FIA to create the rule book. But I think first big step is the racing will be closer because there's less aerodynamic uh, uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, more aerodynamic restrictions. And then development of the car is slightly less, but under the bonnet, you can still do a lot more. Lah. So racing will be better, more cost, cost capping. So I think it's heading the right path. And what Formula One needs is actually more teams. More teams, then more opportunities for young drivers, young talents. You know, now we have seen like Ferrari, Ferrari has a B team Alfa Romeo, Red Bull, Red Bull has a B team Alfa Tori. 
and Mercedes has Mercedes powered teams that they place their drivers. So if, if there's more teams or more manufacturers, then everyone's given more chances. Mm. When you say add more teams, that would mean add more drivers. Mm. And do you think it's a smart move to add more drivers or do you think 20 is like enough already? Is there any issue with having 20 drivers on the grid? <laughs> no, no, there's no issues now. I think, I think uh, Liberty, Liberty Group has done a fantastic job in, in opening up more uh, advertising and promotional avenue for the sport, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah, like recently, everyone had came up with a lot the of content. content. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's super. You know, the esports, the good. YouTube, and you know, amazing, amazing stuff, and um, which has not been seen for a very long time. Um, but what's next? I I believe is uh, that everyone, a lot of talents get stuck because this, there's also good talents in Formula 1 still and young mm. talents you know? Lando Norris is like 21 years old mm. and Charles Leclerc is 20 Albon's like 19 everyone's so young and, and you're expecting them to have long careers Correct. In F1. so if you have more teams then a lot more can be um, given a chance la. so there's nothing wrong with 20 cars in the grid but I think 24, 26 would be better Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, good, good, good. Because like all these younger drivers, so they are very good, and you don't want to see all the experienced driver to go away. Yeah, also. like exactly. Hamilton. As much as a lot of people say it's getting boring seeing him <laughs> winning and getting podiums all the time. Yeah, but it's somehow like a a fun element to have him around. For sure, still, right? For sure. Because if he's gone, like you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to say, but like it won't feel the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything feels so fresh. Then that might be boring. Also, correct, correct. Yeah. I think Lewis brings a lot of um, commercial avenue to mm-hmm. one. You know, I think he changed the game with, um, you know, with with using Formula One as his voice. You know, he he uses it a lot, um, showcasing his talent, being in you know, uh, being involved in some movements. And also, um, you know, he he's living in LA, right? So he has the American lifestyle that brings a lot to Formula One as well, mm-hmm. you know, with the the people that he knows. So it's 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 a person that Formula One needs. So yeah. All right, cool. Let's get Jasmine some water. <laughs> <laughs> but you seem to know a lot about racing. You like racing. I, I mean. Of course, I have to do research for this uh, podcast, <laughs> but I also, I like F1. Oh, you do like F1? Yeah, okay. but only F1. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not like, other unlike, of- unlike you, I don't watch like all the other, other races stuff. and whatnot. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. F1 also, I think, because like, that's the, that's the highest, that's the pinnacle. That's the pinnacle, yeah. yeah so yeah. I don't really want to, don't want to see other stuff. I don't see F2, F3. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 True la. True, true, true. All right. So for those of you who are oh, listening, you. listening this to in Spotify, yeah, we are giving Jasmine free a drink. water. <laughs> Let's talk about your time during your days as a Petronas. I don't know. Were you like a training driver, third driver, or something? Oh, within the team? Um, no. Test driver. I was. Uh, they call it development driver. All oh, right. Okay. So I was involved in the simulator development. They had an incredible piece of of um, simulator. Mm-hmm. And then I was attending to about six to eight Grand Prix a year to be part of the team and to learn. And, and at that time, it was um, from Rosberg and Schumacher to Rosberg and Lewis mm-hmm. right up to the tail end of 2015 until the program stopped. Um, also, at the time, being a development driver, I, I had the opportunity to test the Formula 1 car. So I drove five occasions in Silverstone, in Portugal. I did the demo in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. So I, I drove the Formula Oh, the one in Jalan Ampang, that yes, one, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. That was cool. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so I had the opportunity to do it. Lah. So I was very involved with the team and, and um, it was actually, uh, Brackley was about an hour from where I lived. So every week or alternate weeks, I was, in, I was spending time in Brackley, you know, um, learning from the engineers. Mm-hmm. And I used to see Rosberg and, and um, ask their, their advice and stuff like that. Lah. So... It was a it was a great opportunity that that, that was given to me So I made the most out of it when I was there. <laughs> um, when you were work not work do you, do you call it working? Do you um, call it working? Yeah, technically yeah. When you were yeah. part of the team, yeah, Petronas, part, yeah. part, part when of you the were in program, yeah. part of Mercedes AMG Petronas, yeah. you were under the leadership of Toto, right? Uh, yeah, Ross Ross Braun first two thousand mm-hmm. um, two thousand eleven to thirteen. 
And then Toto came over after that. Was it? Yeah. Was it because he invested or something? No, I think I think Ross was ready to yeah. ready to retire. Um, he's been in the sport for so long, but now he's back in you know his his the Formula One group um, advisor or whatever. Um, then Toto came in. Um, yes, he had some shares, and he also had some shares in Williams. Williams yeah. But he was involved in uh, Mercedes AMG DTM team, so I think that's how he kind of got his way into the Formula One. Do you have your experience working with him? Yeah, yeah. I um, I still speak to him now and again today, um, and we worked together. He was very approachable. Um, but he was very sharp. He was very honest. He didn't want to waste your time nor his time. Um, he was very, time was very valuable to him. So he, he has no time to like, you know, beat around the bush and everything. And I know he lives, he lives in Oxford. So um, yeah, Toto, Toto was, a, was a great guy to, to, to know, la, you know. Yeah, and, I mean, um, I, mean yeah. I asked you this question because like, he kind of like let this Petronas team to be very... Mm. Invincible, <laughs> essentially, because you guys have been winning for the past what five yeah, seasons, correct. six seasons. It's it's going back to what I said about the youth, and he's still quite young. Mm-hmm. If you know, I mean, Mercedes board members are all you know people that's been in the game for thirty, forty years, and this guy is like a young, late thirty, early forties, mm-hmm. um, uh, entrepreneur, right? So there's an entrepreneur element, there is like the passion element. Yeah. And he's ready to drive this thing forward, right? So his hunger may be different to other corporate players, but but he has really been a great leader and 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 uh, talent spotter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he he spot talents very very well. So now he plays a big part in in the sport, lah. Mm-hmm. So Mercedes AMG Petronas. So Petronas <laughs> has been really a great supporter, great sponsor for the mm. Mercedes team. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think there is more ways and avenues for MNCs and GLCs to help teams? Oh, it's a good question. Can be sensitive, but okay. Um, yes. I think human capital development for Malaysians should be more enhanced because the developing phase at the moment, there's only very little programs or individuals that are only proven. But some talents should be also spotted to groom because right. because if you're given a chance to groom, for example, like Red Bull, right? Um, up, up three to five years into the program, you can see whether he's going to be the next world champion. Like mm. Sebastian Vettel, he's been picked up from Red Bull from eleven years old. Yeah, very young. Very young. By sixteen, you can tell. I think this guy is going to be world yep. champion. So by eighteen, he did his first Formula One, and he like he was scoring points. Mm-hmm. So if the developing phase was more looked at by GLCs, and I know sometimes it can be a risk factor of uh, no returns, or mm-hmm. or maybe they just do it as a CSR. But our platforms are there in Formula One, in MotoGP. Um, and you know, at the peak of 2010, 2015, we had four F1 teams that that was solely sponsored by Malaysian companies. You know, there was Mercedes AMG Petronas, there was Lotus Grand Prix that was owned by Proton Berhad, mm-hmm. there was um, uh, Marussia that was sponsored by Questnet, and there was a, also Catrum that was owned by Tony, Tony Fernandez. Fernandez yeah. So there's four F1 teams from a small country we come from that were sponsored. But was there a Malaysian driver? No. no. There, was there a Malaysian engineer on the pit wall? No. Strategist? No. Marketer? Maybe yourself? Mm. No. Why? Because it's only looked within Formula 1, but the spillover wasn't looked at. Right. So the spillover brings more value than actually Formula 1. So I think that it needs to be looked in an element, how can we place Malaysians and groom Malaysians into the world stage? And goes back to that confidence issue of yeah. why, mm. why not? Mm, I don't know if I'm capable of doing it. Mm. So, so that's the missing link at the moment. And I think Sepang, um, even the sports ministry and everyone, um, the, 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 the foundations are there, but it needs further enhancement because the platform is already in front of our eyes. Mm. Um, and, and, and a lot of Malaysians are deserved to be given a chance. Got, yeah, right now I think in the sport I think Malaysian is only the oil engineer in Mercedes yeah there's only one and I think there's uh, attachment programs with 
uh, university technology Petronas um, I think for six weeks in, in the F1 team but that's it mm, you know mm. I I think to groom someone it takes years Correct. or to learn something you know to un- actually understand I mean I'm racing for 22 years and I'm still learning the sport right yeah. so some some element takes time in this country like we did mention on how we have to further develop talents and whatnot but right now we have talents like yourself we have uh, Wera and Nabil we have Hafiz Sharin and yep. whatnot where do you see Malaysian's motorsport in five years? You know, ever since Formula One stopped in 2017, um, Sepang and 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 uh, a lot of the industry players have reapproached to a new path, because Formula One has a huge cost factor, right, in bringing in, but the spillover did not materialize as much as what we wanted it. Mm. So now there is private players that are bringing in. Um, international events such as Super GT Asia GT Festival now these guys are private um, entities from from Malaysia you know so if you work the international um, uh, scene and give opportunities to the national guys it will give them more exposure and it's a brilliant brilliant start and and this these entities are uh, bringing in manufacturers from Japan from China like EV cars and stuff like this and and that like I say exposure will give uh, Malaysian young Malaysians a better kickstart lah. So, from that platforms that Sepang is working towards too, I think I think a lot of young talents can be given a chance to further their careers. There is other avenues of motorsport beyond Formula One. There's different disciplines. I mean, mm-hmm. endurance racing, GT, touring cars, local, international, Asian, and etc. So. Uh, to reach to the pinnacle is not just Formula One, is is to to be working with a manufacturer. So I think working with a manufacturer should be um, uh, should be an avenue to be looked at uh, first. How we can bridge the talent to the manufacturers, but within five years, um, I hope to see more talent mm-hmm. uh, from the grassroots levels to to bring a bigger pool, and I hope more talents can rise up the pyramid to to race internationally, lah, and and. Hopefully, bring more trophies home for the flag. <laughs> yeah, more negarakus. More negarakus, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, with the end of F one, yeah. um, in Malaysia and MotoGP just got cancelled here as well. Um, do you think uh, Malaysia put the F one league in Malaysia will ever come back? Um. I think a proper feasibility needs to be done, a feasibility study, because the cost factor is still very high. Uh, I know Formula One is looking to host, I mean, they used to host 20, 21 races a year. Now they're looking to push 26 races, more Asian races, more races in the US. Um, if we can get the cost factor justifiable and talents, more Malaysian talents can get the spillover effect from, from the teams, um, more uh, benefit to the tourism industry um, and the vendors, as, especially for the for 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 our own own Malaysian uh, consumers. Um, I think if we cover all areas, why not? But in the short term, I think the the, the crisis needs to recover itself first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you did mention just now uh, about uh, how the tourism is being affected when you bring in yep. international races and whatnot, right? Yep. Um, is there a way, because we also did mention about the G- Super Asia GT and whatnot, yes. you know how private companies are bringing it, it mm. over. How, how does international races and all, all these teams coming over help the local economy besides tourism? Well, um, there's direct and indirect um, investment. Um, the direct element is that they use Sepang as their facility. Sepang is their base. And... Um, they give up, you know, most of the mechanics or engineers, some of them are Malaysians, you know. So that's the direct investment. The indirect investment is that um, they don't spend two, three days in Malaysia. They spend a week. Yep. You know, they, they, they go holiday in Johor or Redang or whatever and they come back to race, right? Or they go for holiday after the race. So the spillover, yes, you know, you may bring an event that costs, I don't know, 10 ringgit, but... If it, give, if it gives the industry or the economy 50 ringgit in return, why not, right? Correct. So if you can grow back the pool, give the confidence on, on, on this pool does not spill the coronavirus or the COVID um, element, 
um, then it will it will restart the economy again. And we need the foreigners. We need the foreigners um, because we are uh, Malaysia alone may be a bit small, but if we have players from Thailand, from Singapore, and 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 we have players from Hong Kong, uh, Macau, and and that element that that loves coming to Malaysia. But uh, the industry can be grown if if uh, some form of benefits can also um, kickstart the industry, lah. All right, mm. cool. Thank you so much for your cool, time. Cool, man. Today. Thank you. Thank you, Riz. <laughs> Do you have anything to say? No. I'm, to, to I think I think you got a lot of good questions <laughs> covered. But thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, that's it for the first episode of the Inspo Report podcast. I'll see you guys again in the next one.